we are at addiction recovery models session seven the 12 steps in the variance then and now so first we want to start with examining the 12-step paradigm in light of scripture and in light of its own history as biblical counselors specifically and as christians generally we are honor bound to examine the influences from our culture on the church and those whom we counsel since 1935 when alcoholics anonymous aa was quote unquote officially formed up through today the philosophies and tenets of aa have had an ever-growing and ever-widening influence on our culture the greatest influence seen naturally is in the realm of alcoholism and other addictive lifestyles hence it is important for us to examine and understand not only the early history of the movement but to also have a basic understanding of some of the major permutations that have flowed out of the movement now this next portion, um, the early days of AA, um, the, the history um, that was presented in early paper way back, back in 2005, um, very, very helpful in this. This man did a whole lot of research from inside of AA. There's a great deal of information available to anyone who desires to look into the history of AA and the 12 steps. I put the word history in quotes because when one performs an in-depth analysis of the material available, one often finds subjective gleanings taking place. A case in point, a pro 12-step Christian website, 12step.com, has this on its website, face Faith Recovery page. Although the 12 steps traces its origins to Frank Buckner's or Oxford groups of the first half of the 20th century, the roots of faith-based addiction recovery reach as far back as the revivalist movements of the 19th century America. Besides its Christian evangelical origins, faith-based addiction recovery remains larger than just the generic 12 steps. Whether it's Zen Buddhism, Chassidut, or Sufism, all spiritual paths promote a sense of selflessness and surrender to an infinite source. The 12 steps are merely an outgrowth of an American of an America whose Christian roots have dominated the country and yet the 12 steps themselves remain somewhat generic, allowing for people outside of the Christian faith to procure them. Nevertheless, it is important to survey varied approaches to faith as it relates to addiction recovery. The primary focus there is on the addiction, addiction recovery. Okay, that's the primary focus. That's the number one goal is addiction recovery. All right, so there, actually, there were actually two AAs. The one that began in 1935 and was abandoned in 1938, while the real basic program didn't begin until after the big book was released in the spring of 1939. We say the real one is that's the one we have today. It's called the real one, but it isn't. Again, we've switched the, the name tags. Others thought there had been a split between East and West in the effort that began with Bill and Bob and Akron in June, on June 10th of 1935. And while the details have been made murky and confusing by neglect, the time is long overdue to see how AA really developed, what its real roots were, and how the complete historical picture can help us in our day and time deal with counselees who have been societally inundated with AA philosophy and 12-step jargon. Though seemingly never at odds with each other, AA's two founders, William Griffith Wilson, Bill W., and Robert Holbrook Smith, Dr. Bob, brought diverse, conflicting, and often ignored backgrounds to the recovery table. Dr. Bob, the elder of the two, was born in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. He and his family were as Christian as they come. His father taught Sunday school at the North Congregational Church for 40 years. His mother was a fervent church-going pillar of that same church. The Smith family did in its church what so many dedicated Christians did in their churches, and many still do. The Smiths often attended four prayer and other services each week. Son Bob dived into Christian Endeavor, the young people's group at the church. Five times a week, Bob was fed the Bible, prayer, Christian literature, quiet times, conversions, witnessing, and fellowship. This was long before the Oxford group was even a twinkle in Frank Buckman's eye. Later, Bob attended St. Johnsbury Academy, where there was, among other strains of definite religious emphasis. And despite his drinking episodes, Bob was linked to Christian churches and membership throughout his life. When he completed his college and medical school educations, he married the Christian lady, Anne Ripley. 
He was soon affiliated with St. Luke Church, took his kids, kids to Sunday school in Akron, and later became, with Anne, a charter member of the West Side Presbyterian Church and worshiped there for several years. Finally, Dr. Bob concluded his church and earthly life as a communicant at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Akron. Moreover, he read the Bible from beginning to end at least three times, devoted at least one hour each day to reading mostly religious literature, and had quiet individual prayer sessions three times a day. During these, he studied scripture, some important Bible passage, prayed, sought guidance, and then, as he said, went about my father's business. Bill W.'s story is as different as a night from day, except for the fact that Bill, too, was born and raised in Vermont, East Dorset, Vermont, to be exact. There's been found no record of church participation by Bill's parents before or after they parted ways. Bill apparently was involved in a Sunday, in a Sunday school until age 12, when he left in protest over a temperance pledge. In other words, taking a pledge that they would not get involved with alcohol. Bill long characterized himself as a conservative atheist. Now, hang on a minute, conservative atheist, that's it. Atheist, there is no God. He said he'd never studied the Bible until he came, until he came to Akron in 1935. He never belonged to a church. And despite strong and deep friendships with Episcopalian Reverend Samuel Shoemaker, and Roman Catholic Jesuit priest Ed Dowling never joined either the Episcopal or Roman Catholic denominations. Bill married a non-Christian, Lois Burnham, in a uh, Swedenborgian church, a marital tie that carried with it Lois's family who had been active Swedenborgian clergy. Also, Lois's declaration that she didn't believe she needed a conversion and didn't much care for the first century Christian fellowship, the Oxford group, through which whose auspices her husband became sober. For his part, Bill often said he had felt superior to most Christians and that if he believed in any God at all, it was the small g God of science. Such was the background of the two Vermonters who founded AA. So then we have two distinctly different pre-sobriety roots. The two totally different AA programs that mark the beginning of AA's growth can be distinguished this way. One can call, be called the Akron Group because AA co-founder Dr. Bob landed in Akron, Ohio from Vermont to make his home and conduct his medical practice. AA itself was founded in Akron and the real AA success story grew out of the work in Akron. The other program can be called the New York Group. Although the real spiritual roots of AA, even early New York AA, go back much further than New York, the elements of the New York program were produced by New Yorker Bill Wilson, centered in New York and mentored on the East Coast by activists in New York's Calvary Episcopal Church and its rector, Reverend Sam Schumacher. The New York people ultimately produced the second program which became embodied in AA's Big Book and 12 Steps. Of the two, it was the Akron Group program that achieved the early and astonished successes and success rates. It is this early program that many believe was has been preserved in the AA and other 12-step programs of today. Not so. Today's dismal 1% to 5% success rates lie in the abandonment of the power of Almighty God and the way in which he graciously guided the Akron pioneers as they asked for his revelation and also studied his Bible for his revealed written will. So the roots of the Akron genesis of Alcoholics Anonymous. The Dr. Bob root of AA began all the way back in Dr. Bob's youth at St. Johnsbury Church in Vermont. From that venue grew Dr. Bob's belief that Bible study, conversion to Christ, individual and group prayer, a continuing quest for God's will and God's guidance, strenuous and demanding effort to obey God, the reading of religious literature, fellowship, love, and service, each and all of them contain the ingredients for a new and abundant life in Christ. Key phrase, new and abundant life in Christ. That was the focus. According to his son, Smitty, Dr. Bob was really much more interested in the message than in the views of a messenger. Hence, his ultimate focus was mainly on biblical fellowship rather than on church activity like that in which his, his parents had been intensely involved. In a nutshell, however, far too little attention has been paid to the research of Akron AA and to the huge United Christian Endeavor movement that had begun in Williston, Maine in February of 1883, 
not long before Dr. Bob's birth in St. Johnsbury, Vermont on August 8, 1879. That dynamic society quickly spread its outreach like wildfire to a worldwide and astonishing large membership of some 3,500,000 people. And its remarkable membership numbers and growth certainly equaled and, and probably exceeded that of the combined memberships at their peak of the much discussed Washingtonians, Oxford Group, and Al Alcoholics Anonymous altogether. Christian Endeavor societies were numerous, and their literature was voluminous with hymnal, hymnals, guidebooks, pamphlets, and newspapers, as well as Christian books and articles. Their focus, like that of early A, a was local, yet their membership and conventions were worldwide in scope. The program was very simple, much like the simplicity and approach that was so much stressed by Dr. Bob. So let's talk about the Christian Endeavor Society. The Christian Endeavor Society tree had four simple roots. One is confession of Christ, two, service for Christ, three, fellowship with Christ's people, four, loyalty to Christ's church. The Christian Endeavor Society's founder, Dr. Clark, said it was an organization as nearly self-governing and self-propagating as any organization can be, with these later to be descriptive of two major group characteristics of its AA stepchild. The, now look at the required simple pledge of covenant was trusting in the Lord Jesus for strength. I promise that I will strive to do whatever he would like to have me like to have me do, that I will make it the rule of my life to pray and to read the Bible every day and to support my own church in every way, especially by attending all her regular Sunday and midweek services, unless prevented by some reason which I can conscientiously give to my Savior, and that just so far as I know how, throughout my whole life I will endeavor, Christian endeavor, to lead a Christian life. As an active member, I promise to be true to all my duties, to be present and to take some part aside from singing in every Christian Endeavor prayer meeting, unless hindered by some reason which I can conscientiously give to my Lord and Master. If obliged to be absent from the monthly consecration meeting of the society, I will, if possible, send at least a verse of scripture to be read in response to my name at the roll call. Uh, nothing like that in AA at all, nothing like that ever. The actual practices of a Christian Endeavor Society can be described as, one, acceptance of Christ as one Savior, with conversion meetings to foster such decisions, daily individual study and group Bible study meetings, three, daily individual prayer as, as well as fellowship prayer meetings, study and topical discussion of religious literature, quiet hour involving individual confession of Christ, Bible study, prayer, and seeking God's guidance. Six was support of one's church. Seven, lo love and service as the code of conduct. So then we move into the Oxford group and their distinctly different practices. Many who are not familiar with Christian Endeavor or its practices are equally unfamiliar with the details of early Akron AA meetings, practices, and principles hold their noses with joyous reporting without justification that early Akron AA was part of the Oxford group and therefore unsuccessful. Simply not so. The Oxford group did not involve decisions for Christ or conversion meetings, nor did it give a special emphasis to Bible study and prayer meetings, nor did it encourage the reading of much Christian literature other than the many Oxford group writings themselves, nor did it allow for self-propagation or self-government. The Oxford group founder, Frank N.D. Buckman, was the boss, and Buckman called the signals for his followers. Most significant, the Oxford group was primarily a life-changing entity rather than an organization that fostered conversions, Bible study, prayer, and reading. So what you can understand about this is, is the life-changing aspect, is it, that's, that's a morality thing, and it fostering conversions is a relationship with Christ thing. It was, however, derived from and much involved in the pre-Christian endeavor and pre-Oxford group practice of quiet time, which was sometimes called a quiet hour and earlier called the morning watch. In almost every aspect, the Akron Pioneer Christian Fellowship, as they called themselves, was a solid match in principle, meetings, and practice for the Christian endeavor movement, in which Dr. Bob had intensely, by his own characterization, been trained as a youngster. The key differences between the two groups, Akron and New York, can be seen by comparing Akron with each 
th uh, other three types of societies, the long ignored Christian endeavor groups, the monolithic Oxford groups and its characterized first century Christian fellowship devoted, devoted to world changing through life change. And there's still Oxford houses today, by the way. The pioneer AA group in Akron, which characterized itself as a Christian fellowship, had no national or international leadership and devoted itself to Bible study, old fashioned prayer meetings, use of Christian devotionals, regular quiet times, conversions to Christ, and serving God and their fellow sufferers by love and practical service. So today there's ample evidence to show which society resembled which and which society differed from which. The primary evidence can be found in the AA conference approved title, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, Alcoholics Anonymous World Services, 1980. That official AA history establishes that John D. Rockefeller, Jr.'s agent, Frank Amos investigated the Akron AA scene in great depth, specifically described its ingredients and left us with a splendid and simple description of his program that very little resembled that of the Oxford group or its principles and practices. And yet in almost every particular is a dead ringer for the local Christian endeavor prototypes of Dr. Bob's youth. Now, the reason this is important is because people say, oh, well, AA grew out of the Oxford groups, which were Christian. Nope. According to the history that we just covered, that's not the case. Okay. But again, that's the propaganda that people have been listening to and repeating for so long. That's what they believe to be true. So now we're going to look at the New York, New York genesis of AA. The New York story is fairly well known, though some of its ingredients are not. Unfortunately, this New York timeline has become the AA story the one in Bill's story, the one in many biographies of Bill, and the one usually mentioned by AA historians. It is, of course, important only if fully and correctly told, but it really only reports on the program Bill fashioned from it with his 1939 publication of the Big Book. It ignores the details of Dr. Bob's religious training during, during his childhood to his renewed religious quest in Akron in the 1930s. And it winds up highlighting New York AA as an unhappy Oxford group offshoot instead of as a Christian fellowship offshoot unique to Akron. Nonetheless, the New York story is one which also needs to be fully told. So we're going to talk about the connection between Roland Hazard and Dr. Carl Jung. The exact time of occurrence of the Hazard-Jung events is murky and disputed. It seems safe to conclude that Roland Hazard, member of a prominent Rhode Island family, had been suffering the pangs of alcoholism for many years. Around 1930 or 1931, he paid two different visits to the famed Swiss psychiatrist, Dr. Carl Gustav Jung. The first was for treatment, but was followed by Roland's return to drinking. The second was for Roland's despairing report to Jung that the treatment had failed. Whereupon Dr. Jung told Roland that Roland had the mind of a chronic alcoholic, and could never be helped by human means, but might be cured through a conversion. Jung recommended religious association. What's interesting about that is Jung was a spiritist, and he's the only one of the founder, founders of any major branch of psychology who was not a, a staunch atheist and naturalist. Jung believed in the supernatural. Um, matter of fact, he got involved in the supernatural, trying to figure out why, try to make sense of his own nightmares. Um, Roland sought out the Oxford group and followed its life-changing precepts. And a seemingly accurate conclusion as to the resultant facts would have, have it that Roland was permanently cured, went on to start the AA ball rolling with Abby Thatcher in New England, and figured prominently in the subsequent writings about and activities of Reverend Sam Schumacher, Jr. and Calvary Episcopal Church in New York. The hazard young events are often characterized as an inter introduction by young of conversion as a viable solution to alcoholism. What we've already seen in the history, that's not true. Conversion to Christianity had been part of the, the, early, the early movement before AA was even a thing, but that was because of what had happened in Dr. Bob's life. Every Thatcher and Roland Hazard. So Roland appears to have mastered the Oxford group's life-changing principles and practices. One of these was the principle of sharing for witness, passing on the message of what God had done that the Oxford grouper could not have done, could not do for himself. Do you hear the language 
under that underlies some of the 12 steps. Roll in a couple of other Oxford group friends, Shep Cornell and Zebra Graves, procured the release by a judge to their custody of an alcoholic from Albany, New York, named Edwin T. Thatcher, also known as Ebby. It seems quite clear that Roland Hazard thoroughly indoctrinated Ebby with Oxford group ideas. This tutoring produced several results. Ebby learned the Oxford group life changing ideas quite well. Ebby was placed in, placed in by Hazard in Reverend Sh Sam Schumacher's Calvary Rescue Mission and there answered an altar call and made a decision for Christ. Facts seldom, seldom correctly or adequately reported. Remember, he made a decision for Christ. Ebby applied the Oxford group sharing for witness technique and sought out his old al alcoholic friend, Bill Wilson, to give him a deliverance message. Now remember, that message from Ebby would have involved Christ. Though Wilson was kicking and screaming, Ebby presented Bill with a straightforward statement that he, Ebby, had got religion, that God had done for him what he could not do for himself, and that by learning and applying the Oxford group principles, he'd been converted and cured. The Thatcher hazard events are sometimes characterized as constituting the introduction into AA of the Oxford's group, Oxford Group's practical program of action as a method for achieving the conversion ingredient of recovery that Dr. Young had told Roland Hazard would be needed for recovery. Okay, so we're going to pause here for a second and talk about what we've, what we've covered so far. Um, how much of this is brand new information to you? Okay, how many of you are hearing things that contradict what you've heard about AA and the 12 steps before? Anybody? It's hard, I never know what, what kind of a mix we're gonna get with the different cohorts, because we've had some cohorts where we've had two or three students who've been through AA and 12 steps, um, actually been, you know, uh, part of it for a long time, or out, um, or one of those similar 12-step organizations. Okay, so let's move into the second part then. Conversions, well, wait a minute, one more question. So do you see why there's, there's so much confusion today about what the real roots of AA are, and that significant part, and the aspect that really was Christian, that information has been abandoned, forsaken, left out. It's just not part of the AA story that's told today. And that's significant. Because if you're not telling the whole story, you're not getting the accurate facts. So you're, you're the, the, what AA promises and the pedigree it says it comes from isn't actually accurate. All right, so let's talk about conversions, Calvary mission, and Bill's recovery. So this part of the story is frequently omitted, distorted, or misrepresented. But Dick B's years of research have now documented some of its important aspects. First, Ebby went to the altar at Calvary mission, made a decision for Christ, and was converted. Second, Bill Wilson followed suit, went to Calvary mission, stating he wanted what Ebby had received. Wilson soon responded to the altar call, made a decision for Christ, and was converted, though wandering drunk and aimlessly for a short time and then checking into Towns Hospital. Ebby visited Bill in Towns Hospital and elaborated on the Oxford Group practical program of action. Bill followed directions, humbly offered himself to God as he then understood God, cried out, if there be a God, let him show himself, and reporting, reported having his famous hot flash experience. Bill's experience and recital of it was much like that of his grandfather in Vermont. It caused Bill to believe that he had found God and had had a conversion experience. Whatever Bill had, whether at Calvary Rescue Mission or at Towns or at both, Bill Wilson never drank again, although he struggled egregiously with several other forms of addiction until the day of his death, tobacco and sleeping with other men's wives, to name two. Uh, Dr. Silkworth and Professor William James. Just exactly how valid the so-called disease theory of alcoholism may be is a matter that has been discussed and disputed for many years. Dr. William D. Silkworth, the Silkworth, chief psychiatrist at Towns Hospital, who had often treated Wilson, may have espoused it. 
But if we take Wilson at his word, Dr. Silkworth, both during and after Bill's last hospitalization, imbued Wilson with a theory that his malady was both mental, an obsession of the mind, and physical, accompanied by an allergy of the body, and perhaps required some kind of moral psychology to cure it. The fact is that Dr. Norman Vincent Peale later made clear that Silkworth himself believed that the great physician, Jesus Christ, was the one who could successfully cure alcoholism. And when Wilson reported the hot flash to Silkworth, the good doctor said he couldn't explain the event but could observe the change in Bill and that Bill should hang on to what he had found. What's interesting about that hot flash is when you take a look at other documentation, there was very likely a physical reaction to the medications that he was on, the, the psychotropics that he was on in the hospital. So these events in context have often been characterized as linking the problem alcoholism is defined by Silkworth, with a solution, conversion is prescribed by Jung, which was produced by a religious program, the practical life-changing program of the Oxford Group, as Roland had described it to Evie and Evie to Bill. While in Towns Hospital, Bill had been given a copy of Professor William James's, James's The Varieties of Religious Experience. The book was reportedly given to Wilson by either Roland Hazard or Evie Thatcher. Wilson believed that the religious experience accounts by William James, plus the professor's analysis of them, validated Wilson's own religious experience. Bill also felt he had discovered from the James book another founding recovery ingredient, that the conversion or religious experience had to be preceded by deflation in depth, or what they call hitting rock bottom today. At this point, Wilson felt he had been cured through a program that addressed seemingly hopeless alcoholism articulated surrender of self through life-changing techniques and produced a resultant conversion in relationship with God, which in turn assured a cure for alcoholism, one that needed to be told abroad. This he had been trying with almost from the moment he got sober, but without success. So let's kind of pause there and talk about what we've covered so far. I know it's a lot. Fix my light here. So talk to me about what you're seeing in this so far. I mean, I can see the beginning of manipulation of facts and okay. And how they infiltrated other other things into the mix and and try to fix the outcomes by suggesting other things. Yeah, some of that is just gross misunderstanding of what's what. You know, Bill W. was convert convinced he had a conversion experience, right? Because what what he personally experienced sounded like what somebody else had experienced. So he gave it the same label, right? Think about how easy that is to do. Okay, think about how easy that is to do. If you're desperate to break free of some enormous bondage in your life, and you find something that helps to make somewhat, some kind of a, somewhat of a difference. You're going to put your hope, hope in that, right? We're going to talk about how him talking about all this to people really was ineffective. Remember how we read that Dr. Bob was more focused on the message than the messenger. Well, we're going to see that Bill W. focused on the fact that he was the messenger, but his message wasn't being received. What other thoughts do you have on what we've gone over so far in this?
Well, the, the hot flash thing reminds me of, you know, what the Mormons talk about the burning in the bosom. Uh -huh. you know, this um, kind of physical experience that they claim validates a, a spiritual experience. Yeah, it's a good parallel. But again, when you take a look at how heavily medicated Bill W. was when he was in Towns Hospital, a lot of medical professionals say it really sounds like a physical reaction to the drugs he was on. So, all right, let's go ahead and press on a little bit. So we have the interim failure of Wilson's outreach. Regrettably, secular, universalist, and revisionist AA observers have erroneously fallen for Bill Wilson's own explanation of his failure as an evangelist. Bill said that he had been totally unable to get anyone sober during the first five months of sobriety when he had chased drunks at Towns Hospital, at Calvary Rescue Mission, and at Oxford Group meetings. He concluded that he had failed because he needed to follow sick or suggestion that he must hit his witnesses hard first with the bald facts about medically incurable alcoholism and then present them with the Oxford Group program. See that? Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. You see where that came from? Right. You start to see where what we see today grew out of. He concluded that, that or I mean, but the record is clear from the statements of Wilson and his wife Lois that this effort produced absolutely no success at successes either with the drunks they took into their home or with those approached during Bill's outreach. And these failures continued for some time as Bill himself related. Apologists in AA and in the Oxford group have often chortled that while Bill got nobody sober, he himself did not drink. Hooray! But that's not a program or a, a successful outreach. The far more reasonable and logical conclusion is that Bill was a messenger without a message. He'd never been to church. He'd never read the Bible. He'd not even been had much sober exposure to Oxford group ideas. And he was reportedly not a reader. How then could he have roused the drunks to conversion and salvation? He had theoretical knowledge about what other people had experienced. It reminds me of Simon the Magician in the book of Acts, right? You guys remember the story, right? Right? Yeah. Simon so said, give me some of this Holy Spirit thing you got going on so I can be famous too. It just really reminds me of that story. We know it didn't turn out well for Simon. Right? Okay. A change of scene in Akron. We've, we've told before and elsewhere the story of the Wilson Smith meeting at Henry Edward, Henrietta Sieberlin Gate Lodge in Akron. Uh, see Dick B. Henrietta B. Uh, Sieverling, Ohio's Lady with a Cause. We can also read about what Bill and Bob did together in the summer of 1935. So if you see Dick B., the guy that, that I'm, whose material I'm drawing from, the Akron Genesis of Alcoholics Anonymous. But what we have devoted our time to most recently is a totally different scene Bill encountered in Akron when he met and stayed with the Smiths. Bill participated in arranging hospitalizations, Bible study, group prayers, seeking God's guidance, acceptance of Christ, quiet times, and team outreach by groups of individuals. And right away, those efforts produce cures. Bob was cured in a few weeks. AA number three, Bill Dotson, was cured in a few days. And so it went through the chain of pioneers up to mid-1938. A change in program in 1939. Though he was commissioned after much argument and a split vote in Akron to write a book reporting the Akron pro program to the world, Bill did not do that. He began work on his big book in mid-1938, but from the beginning, its writing and publication was a commercial venture that he worked on with his partner, Hank Parkhurst. Bill drew on a variety of new sources. One was the alcoholism treatment comments by lay therapist Richard Peabody. Another was the new thought ideas from Emmett Fox and others. New thought is, if you know, if you know the, the, the secret, and you also, um, it's basically the fourth level of Buddhism where you, 
you continue the you repeat the mantra over and over and over and you create your own reality you speak things into existence uh we find that we find new thought actually christianized new thought as the foundation of the word of faith movement still another and the major one was a prototype of the oxford group principles as reduced from 28 to 12 and embodying almost the very language bill had learned from oxford oxford group leader reverend sam schumacher moreover wilson salted into the language of the big book several new age counterfeits of christian words and phrases a lot of people don't know that and he left out the major elements of the akron program the bible akron's christian literature and smith's journal and quiet time a new idea and a new language were fashioned to appeal to atheists and agnostics and those of non-Christian faiths. The simple United Christian Endeavor principles and practices from Dr. Bob's youth were never once mentioned. The word cure was deleted from AA vocabulary and replaced with once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. And the results seemed to have been verified, seemed to have verified the validity of the new new cure proclamation, all but a small percentage of fellow, fellowship members. In other words, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy because it's an ineffective program. So if this is the program you're following, you will never not be an alcoholic. But it's not because of alcoholism. It's because the program's a failure. It's not because of the disease you have. It's because the program you're using is worthless. So some conclusions we can draw from this. Statistical surveys show that today's AA produces only a small percentage of permanent abstainers, one to 5%. Documented records of the 1930s and early 1940s show 75 to 93% success rate during that AA period. We're talking about Akron. Christian and atheist groups alike point out that alcoholism can be cured without AA, with Christians stressing the power of God and secularists count uh, stress, stressing the power of the will. AA itself has stopped growing. Treatment programs are being eliminated. Treatment money is being directed toward every conceivable malady that will enable government and insurance money to be received. Watered down AA with ever increasing idolatry, simplistic emphasis on meetings, and the rejection of religious beliefs and religious expressions has not resulted in desirable support or results. And a huge number of alcoholics and addicts, both within and outside of AA, are simply not recovering. The time is long overdue for a careful look at the factual AA history and discard the fruit, or lack of it, AA and its 12-step approach has produced, returning to Christ, the Bible, prayer, worship, and the like. Okay, As biblical counselors, it behooves us to have a clear understanding of the roots of AA the deformed version of AA and its variants that are, exist today and hold to the clear understanding and teaching that God has done and will do for alcoholics and others trapped in besetting sin what they could not and cannot do for themselves. It is only our creator who can provide true victory in these battles. Okay. So I want to wrap this up by looking at a partial listing of AA adapted 12 step programs. So as we noted before, 12 step programs have become adopted wildly, widely by a variety of self-help groups. And typically they only adopt the steps with the approval of AA. Many Christian groups and programs have loosely adapted the 12 steps without officially doing so. Yet still with the underlying philosophy of the New York Genesis remain in them. And while we delve into these in greater detail, or we will delve into these in greater detail over the next two weeks. So we have 12-step programs for alcoholism. We have AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, ACA, also known as ACOA, Adult Children of Alco Alcoholics. My mother went to that. Al-Anon and al for friends and family members of alcoholics. Then you have 12-step programs for addiction. NA, Narcotics Anonymous. AAA, All Addictions Anonymous, CA, Cocaine Anonymous, CDA, Chemically Dependent Anonymous, CMA, Crystal Meth Anonymous, MA, Marijuana Anonymous, and NIC A, Nicotine Anonymous. What's interesting is that 
you've got the 12 steps being followed for all of these hyphenated addict anonymous, right? It's all rooted in the same stuff. Why can't they just use one group? How about Gamblers Anonymous or Gamma Non Gamma Team for friends and family members of problem gamblers or Olga, Online Gamblers Anonymous. Then we have SAA, Sex Addicts Anonymous, COSA, Codependence of Sex Addicts, COSLA, Co-Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, SANON, Spouses and Family Members of Sexaholics, SA, Sexaholics Anonymous, SCA, Sexual Compulsives Anonymous, SLAA, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, SWA, Sex Workers Anonymous, and then you have the Sex Industry Survivors. Then you have DEPANON, Depressed Anonymous, DDA, Dual Diagnosis Anonymous, DRA, Dual Recovery Anonymous. This is where you have, you have um, uh, alcoholism or other drug, and then you also have a um, uh, another uh, comorbidity, as it's called. Uh, NAIL, Neurotics Anonymous. OCA, Obsessive Compulsive Anonymous. And if they were really obsessive compulsive, it would be ACO, alphabetical order. SA, see there's another SA, Schizophrenics Anonymous. You want to make sure you go to the right SA group, right? SMA, Self Mutilators Anonymous, SPA, Social Phobics Anonymous, WA, Workaholics Anonymous, CLA, Clutterers Anonymous, DA, Gutters Anonymous, another SA, Spinners Anonymous. Oh Lord, you could really be messed up if you went to the wrong SA group, right? Then you have ABA, Anorexics and Bulimics Anonymous, CEA, Compulsive Eaters Anonymous, EAA, Eating Addictions Anonymous, EDA, Eating Disorders Anonymous, FA, Food Addicts and Recovery Anonymous, FAA, Food Addicts Anonymous, GSA, Great Cheaters Anonymous, OA, Overeaters Anonymous. Then you have Chapter 9, Couples in Recovery. This is for emotional issues. You have CODA, Codependence Anonymous. You have EA, Emotions Anonymous. You have EHA, Emotional Health Anonymous, FA, Families Anonymous, RCA, Recovering Couples Anonymous, SIA, Survivors of Incest Anonymous. Then you have Arts Anonymous, Co-Anon for Families and Friends of Addicts, NAR-Anon for Friends and Families Members of Addicts, and RA, Recovery Anonymous, the Solution Focused 12 Step Fellowship. There's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of anonymous. And the whole thing about anonymous is you know, You'll know each other's first name, but that's all you'll know about each other. And if you you never share with anybody else that you anybody else was there, um, if you run into somebody outside of a meeting, you never acknowledge that where you know each other from. It's really about an, an anonymity and keeping things keeping things private. You know what happens in the group stays in the group, that kind of a thing. And that in itself, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, not on the surface, but what ends up happening um, um, is that the group becomes a counterfeit church. The meetings become a counterfeit savior. The morality of the group is what determines the morality of the individual members of the group. Not God, not his word, not the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Okay? And when we get into talking about <clears throat> uh, celebrate recovery, that's the they actually use that language. Right. So what kind of thoughts do you have on what we covered on the, all of the history of AA and where we are today with it.